News starts right now. It is week two of the vaccine rollout, and now shipments are headed to pharmacies in smaller communities throughout our area. That includes Atascosa County, which is getting 1,200 doses for four facilities. Those doses will be sent to two HEBs and two local clinics. Devin Clark shows us why a doctor at one of them says the opportunity to administer the COVID-19 vaccine is not only an honor, it's also a relief. We just feel it's an honor to be there for the community and the, in our country, really. 500 doses of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine were allotted for quality urgent care in Pleasanton. They haven't even arrived at the family-owned clinic yet, but medical director Dr. Namesh Patel is already feeling the excitement and a weight lifted off of his team's shoulders. We've been here um, from the front desk to the nursing staff, to the providers, even to the janitorial services. Dr. Patel is looking forward to first immunizing the health workers and support staff at his clinic and throughout the area who have sacrificed so much during the pandemic and then people in the community. I lost a dear friend of mine from my church community. Um, it was a, a terrible loss. Pleasanton native Rebecca Casanova is feeling COVID-19's devastating impact. My immediate family members right now have it. But Casanova still has reservations about getting the vaccine. I am apprehensive of what's in the vaccine. While he understands the concerns around the quickly manufactured and released immunizations, Dr. Patel is hoping that when the vaccine is rolled out to the general public in coming months, folks in this close-knit community will roll up their sleeves. We really feel that this is the, the next phase in the pandemic. This is, I think, our way of hoping things get back to a more of a normal uh, environment for us. And as far as exactly when that first shipment of vaccines will get here, Dr. Patel said he's not exactly sure sometime this week or early next week. But he says as soon as it does come in, he'll roll that distribution plan out immediately. Reporting in Pleasanton, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. And by the way, Bear County already has the Pfizer vaccine. Now HEB pharmacies across the state are among those expecting the first shipment of Moderna's vaccine. An HEB spokesperson tells us 4,500 doses will be arriving later this week at 44 of its pharmacies in Bear County. Soon after that, vaccinations will begin, but only for health care and other essential workers. They've been given top priority under the Tier 1A guidelines laid out by the state of Texas and the CDC. We want to keep everyone as safe as humanly possible, and I believe this is a great step in the right direction. The vaccine not yet available to the general public. HEB certified immunizers will be giving the vaccinations by appointment only. That information is on our website, ksat.com. New at six, crossing the border no longer routine. Only essential travel is allowed to go back and forth. Given the COVID numbers on both sides of the border, monthly travel restrictions have been extended yet again through mid-January. Understandable, many say. But Jesse DeGoyato says that Loreno's economy is reeling from a triple whammy. The restrictions, the pandemic, and its impact on Mexico's economy as well. Downtown Laredo is practically deserted. Empty streets, vacant storefronts, Joy's Novelties, one of the few still able to open, only because Jose Bueno owns the building and pays no rent. And he says most of his merchandise, like school supplies, appeals to locals. Still, his sales are down 80%. Muy triste, la verdad, sí. Very sad. It's the truth, says Bueno, but what can we do? Laredo's international bridges don't have the throngs of Mexican shoppers coming across, not since the federal travel restrictions reimposed monthly after the pandemic began. Bridges are still open to, to essential travel, to, to legitimate trade, to emergency purposes, um, public safety, things of that nature, they've been open. Just not to friends and families and those shoppers that are said to make up 40% of retail sales in Laredo. The empty parking lot at a nearby mall, a stark example. How soon could we expect operation to resume to normal. Normal is, is, is subjective word. Bridge traffic, he says, of both pedestrians and vehicles is down 60 percent. And yet, if you fly into the country, you're allowed. But if you come in a car or walk across, you're not allowed. So, so we don't understand that. Downtown 40 years, Bueno says he and others desperately need the business. But given what's happening across the river with the contagion, as he calls it, the risk is real. Laredo already is overwhelmed with COVID cases, and so... 
as far as um, when things will return to normal, um, it's, it's very, very difficult to say. Much less when Laredo's economy will be able to recover. There's no way this is going to we got to take place overnight, even if, even if the bridges were to open tomorrow. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. The San Antonio Food Bank with a Texas twist to its final mega mobile distribution event of the year. Some longtime donors helped provide barbecue for the food recipients and make a tough Christmas a little bit brighter. That's the hope anyway. And as Garrett Berger tells us, if there was a year that extra cheer is needed, it is certainly this one. It took just a few hours for 2,000 households to pass through the Alamo Dome parking lot and collect 150 pounds of food each. Less time than it's probably going to take them to cook some of that meat they got. Each household got a 12-pound brisket from the RK Group and sausage from Kielbasa Smoked Meats. Food Bank says Community First Health Plans also put money behind the event. The Food Bank president and CEO thanked the group's partners and all the volunteers. It's been a tough year. Um, lots of families struggling, but to be able to get this Texas Christmas, a little bit of barbecue for families, um, it means the world. The Food Bank has been hosting mass distribution events like this throughout the pandemic because of COVID precautions, the loss of many of their partner agencies that helped the distribution, and a huge increase in need. They're now helping about 120,000 people each week across 16 counties compared to 60,000 before the pandemic. It may have been the last mega distribution event for the year, but if your family needs help, you can still get it. There's more information on the San Antonio Food Bank website. At the Alamo Dome, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. In time saver traffic now, let's take a look at the TransGuide camera here, Loop 410 and Calabra. You can see it looks like there's some construction in this area. Those flashing lights you see here, though, on the on-ramp where that slowdown is, we're not sure if that's connected to any of the construction or if this is a separate rack. It looks like it might potentially be that, but certainly slowing down traffic uh, as drivers make their way on to Loop 410 here at Calabra. New at six for the first time in more than 100 years, a historic area church will not have an in-person Christmas Day service. Earlier today, St. Mark's Episcopal Church, located downtown, pre-recorded its Christmas Day service. That'll be streamed on the church's website come Christmas morning. Members with the church say the ongoing coronavirus pandemic led to the tough decision to have a virtual service this year. So we just felt like it wasn't safe to have people inside of our churches at this time and making our way with um, <laughs> telephones and all kinds of things. So when was the last time St. Mark's canceled a Christmas Day service? We're told it likely happened back in 1918 during the Spanish flu pandemic. So many holiday celebrations are going to look so different this year, just all across the board. Looking outside with live cam, meantime, we've got a lot of clouds. As I say, look at those clouds up there. Yeah, the clouds have filled back in, and we're expecting them to lead to some low clouds, drizzle, and fog uh, later on tonight, and especially into the first part of the day tomorrow. You know, we could use some shower activity. Unfortunately, it's just not really in the works right now, other than some drizzle. The aquifer down two tenths of a foot today. We're a little more than six feet below average for this time of year. Take a look at the pollen count here. Mountain cedar, it's that season. It's high again today with a count of about 1900. Mold is on the low end. Now remember, mountain cedar typically peaks in January and then is out of here by about Valentine's Day. Here's a look at the latest readings and we're already in that high range and it's likely to climb again, especially tomorrow night behind a cold front with a northerly breeze. That northerly wind typically boosts the pollen uh, at least mountain cedar numbers. 45 was our temperature this morning. Then we topped out at 75 for the afternoon high. The clouds, despite the clouds, we still were rather warm today, and it's going to be a relatively warm night tonight as well. We're looking at temperatures just in the 60s this evening, and then tomorrow morning right near 60 degrees with fog and drizzle and dampness. But some sunshine into the afternoon will boost us up into the mid-70s for high temperatures. So another pleasant day tomorrow and unseasonably warm. But the wind, that's going to be noticeable about this time tomorrow. That's associated with a cold front that's going to be headed our way. We'll talk more about that cold front and what it means for Christmas coming right up. 32-year-old Samuel Reyes enlisted in the Army, but he never showed up for his first meeting, which was over a week ago. His mom worried sick, traveling all the way from Dallas to help San Antonio police search for him. You'll hear the details tonight. 
Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 this evening, and it is flying above Travis Park in downtown. There is the beautiful Christmas tree decorated like the flag of Texas. Look at that. I mean, they really did Travis Park well, did it up well. <laughs> I'm saying that right this year, as and you can see the flashing lights there. They did a really nice job they did out And there. one of the things, a great uh, quarantine activity I found, you can stay within your own bubble, drive around, look at Christmas lights, something my family did as we were in our own quarantine this very, year. Very, very good idea. Well, without social distancing, wearing a mask may not be enough to stop spread the spread of coronavirus. That's according to scientists at New Mexico State University. They say they used a machine to simulate coughs and sneezes to test different types of masks, including N95s and regular cloth masks. The researchers found that except for the N95 masks, many small sneezes or cough droplets were still able to escape. In their report, the scientists said masks definitely help, but if people are too close to each other, there's still a chance of spreading or contracting the virus. The findings published in today's journal, The Psychics of F Physics of Fluids. You can see how it might be easy to get discouraged. All the news we hear about, there was no perfect protection, but masks certainly one of the things that you can do uh, to try to prevent the spread. And we know the numbers are very high here locally, so let's go now live to City Hall to see the daily briefing for today. 1,717 in a single day of COVID-19, which pushes our seven-day rolling average to 1,174. The total number of cases since the pandemic began is 1,000, excuse me, 105,164. These numbers are extremely concerning, as you know, as we approach the Christmas holiday. More unfortunate news tonight, we do have 11 new deaths to report. Two Hispanic males in their 50s and six, excuse me, 50s, 70s, and 90s, three Hispanic males. Another Hispanic male in their 60s through 60s. Um, an Asian male in his 90s, three white males in their 40s and 70s, and a female in her 70s, another Hispanic female in her 60s. Uh, we report demographic information as they're made available. Sometimes not all the demographic information is made available at the time, so we're reporting the data that we do have. Uh, please keep their friends and families and their survivors in your prayers this evening. We have lost far too many loved ones, even this week, but certainly throughout this pandemic. The stress on our hospital system also continues to increase. As of today, 15.1% of all hospital beds are occupied by a COVID patient. If it stays at 15% or above for seven days under Governor Greg Abbott's order, the state of Texas will automatically restrict occupancy to 50% in many local businesses. We have 912 COVID-19 patients in, the ho in our hospitals tonight. That's up 23 from yesterday. And overnight, we had 133 new COVID admissions, 292 patients are in the ICU, and 145 on ventilators. No matter how you cut it, these are bad numbers, uh, and they should wake up everyone to the reality of COVID-19 in our community and the pandemic and the toll that it's taking on our loved ones. So at 7 p.m. tonight, we will be issuing an emergency alert to all cell phones in the Bear County area. As we have reported for the past few days, we are in the middle of a severe surge of COVID-19 infections in our community. That's the same no matter where you go in this country. Our hospitals are under tremendous stress, and with cases rising, we know they will face even more stress over the next couple of weeks. So the alert is a plea for everyone to slow the spread and celebrate the winter holidays responsibly and only with those in their immediate household. This is not the year to host the big gathering of the Tamalada. It's an, a, been an extremely challenging year, as we know, which has forced us to distance from our loved ones. But having a virtual Christmas is better than hoping for your loved one to recover from the ICU or worse and having to plan a funeral to ring in the new year. Do it for you, do it for your family, and do it for San Antonio. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. You know, I think President-elect Biden uh, today said that we've got our darkest days ahead of us, and I'm afraid he's right. Uh, these numbers do not, um, are not changing, and they're going to continue to go up, I believe. And so it's going to be a really difficult time for us, but I, I do want to say to the CEOs of the, our major hospitals out there, uh, <coughs> Methodist and Baptist and Santa Rosa and, and University Hospital, uh, they're really, really working good together. They're sharing their vaccines together. They're, 
making beds available. And they're going to, as the mayor said, they're under stress. It's, it's not just the fact that um, uh, restaurants and other places are going to be under more scrutiny and be able to have less people come into their establishments, but also, you know, surgeries now are, are in jeopardy, too. So it's, it's a difficult time. You know, there's one thing. You try to look for something that's positive, and it, I must say it's a little hard to look for it right now. But uh, nursing homes... Uh, are down some 15 percent and uh, what we're seeing today is a, a whole change in how we handle uh, telemedicine and how we handle people and it was a wonderful beautiful quote um, about an elderly person that said i don't want to give up the the way i live and that means they want to stay home whether it's with their uh, family or relatives or their own home and so now we seem to be making a transition where we're going to try to keep more people in their home. I, I still, re I mean, my grandfather, my grandmother lived with us all their lives. I still remember the day he died uh, and the day he went to the hospital to die from our home. So hopefully families will come together and take care of their parents and not send them off to a nursing home. And hopefully uh, with the things that we're putting in place now, particularly telemedicine, uh, people can stay home longer, and I think I hope that uh, continues. Thank you, Judge. And it, no matter how you look at the situation here across the state of Texas or across the country, even across the world, COVID-19 is definitely not done uh, this year, uh, nor is it going to be done anytime in the next several months as we await the vaccines to be distributed to the general population. So if we are interested in protecting ourselves, protected in, per, interested in protecting the loved ones uh, or neighbors around us, uh, or even just doing it for our community, we have to work together to slow the spread of this disease. All right, that's the mayor and the county judge revealing that we have a the 1717 new cases that is the highest number of cases since July 1717 bring our total of 105,164 1174 the seven day average and you could certainly tell in both the county judge and the mayor they expect these kind of numbers to last for a while as a matter of fact the county judge says these numbers have not are not changing and they will continue to go up. Also 11 new deaths reported related to COVID-19 in our area. We also heard the mayor talk about how hospital occupancy right now, 15.1% of hospital occupancy is related to COVID, which per Governor Greg Abbott's orders would mean if it stays at that percentage for a certain amount of time, businesses could be forced to lessen their occupancy level, their capacities uh, to 50%. The, the county judge alluded to this as well, that elective surgeries, which are still happening in our area, those could be put on hold uh, if that number stays relatively the same. So there was a lot, a lot of reasons, of course, to decrease these numbers. And you certainly heard that plea, like you said, from both county leaders and city leaders. And expect tonight at 7 o'clock to receive an alert on your cell phone, uh, eye watches, all kinds of devices, a plea to help stop the spread over these winter holidays. And that's something that the mayor, we expect to talk to him later in this newscast. And that's certainly something we will bring up with him. Let's turn now to the forecast out there. 70 degrees right now, Adam, but we are looking for a cool down, a cold front towards yeah, the holiday. Exactly. That's going to hit us tomorrow evening around this time, and that's going to pave the way for cooler conditions into Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. What you need to prepare for tonight is, well, a relatively warm night, but also more fog and drizzle. Take a look at our future cast for the visibility. Likely have those visibilities starting to be reduced by midnight, and then especially thereafter, we'll see visibilities down through the morning commute tomorrow and overall dampness tomorrow morning. Not just reduced visibility with more fog like we had earlier today, but drizzle and a few sprinkles and dampness not really amounting to more than a few hundredths of an inch though here and there. Then by the noon hour, we'll have some sunshine, we'll clear out. It's going to be another warm day tomorrow relative to this time of year. I mean, we're still at 70 here at, in San Antonio and at Port S.A., Castroville 72, 66 Canyon Lake. Bandera right now, 66 in comfort, 65, still about 70 as you head farther to the west, closer to the Rio Grande. Tomorrow morning is going to be an unseasonably warm start to the day, and then the afternoon, well into the 70s. But what you'll notice by this time tomorrow 
is the shifting and strengthening wind. Not a big deal. Tomorrow morning, you're not going to notice it. The afternoon, you won't even notice it. But once that cold front hits and that north wind starts just flowing into town, well, we'll have steady winds at about 20 to 25 miles per hour and some gusts up to 40. So anticipate that tomorrow after dark, wind gusts around 40 miles per hour. If you have the inflatables in the yard, you've been warned. So damp starts the day, sunny afternoon tomorrow, and then clear tomorrow night, but windy and colder will go from the mid 70s tomorrow down to 33 Thursday morning. And that's with a, a stiff breeze out of the door. So wind chills in the 20s Christmas Eve morning, and then only 58 with sunshine by Thursday afternoon. Christmas Day, a freeze likely in the morning at sunrise and then sunny, comfortable and in the mid 60s by the afternoon. And this weekend will warm up again into the 70s. All right, thanks, Adam. Larry will have sports up next. This essay salutes holiday greeting is brought to you by CPS Energy. My name is Yvonne Haker and I work for CPS Energy and I provide direct support to Joint Base San Antonio. From my family to yours, we'd like to wish you a happy holiday and a very Merry New Year. Spurs open the regular season tomorrow night. It will start Greg Popovich's 25th season as the Spurs head coach, currently the longest tenured active coach in all four U.S. major sports leagues. As fans know, Pop loves to teach his players more than basketball. So 22-year-old shooting guard Lonnie Walker IV was asked if he's been able to teach his 71-year-old coach anything. I wouldn't say teach, but we still have our, our jokes. Or I, te I, I teach him a new joke here and there. Or, you know, we have a conversation about Twitter, Twitter trends, which he has no idea what that is. So uh, if you want to talk about him learning about the new day and age, uh, he's learning from the young guns, but he has no idea. I'll stay a rapper and he'd be like, who is that? I have no idea. So uh, <laughs> That's where we are. That is too funny. The Spurs will play at Memphis tomorrow night at 7, their regular season opener. Taff Raiders are crossing their fingers as they get ready to face Buda Hayes in the third round of the Class 6A Division II playoffs. That's because their second round game against Far San Juan Alamo North was canceled after a PSJA student within the program tested positive for COVID-19. Taft got that call Thursday night before the game. I hate it for the kids. They miss out on a moment and experience that, that, that you just can't get back. So I'm hoping this week uh, we get a chance to to get all the way to Thursday, get to one o'clock and, and play this game and have that moment and experience that, they, uh, that they've earned. Taft is scheduled to play Buda Hayes Thursday at 1 p.m. at Shelton Stadium. It is bowl week for the UTSA Roadrunners who are getting ready to face the Louisiana Raging Cajuns Saturday afternoon in the Serve Pro First Responder Bowl in Dallas. UTSA is 7-4 and four and having a great week of practice as they get ready for the 9-1 and one and 19th ranked Raging Cajuns. Everyone's pretty taking this week pretty seriously considering the fact that we had a couple weeks off. Um, but everyone seems to be pretty locked in, you know, ready to go. And we're just excited about the opportunity that we have to playing this bowl game and, you know, potentially make history at one end of the first bowl game for this, uh, for this program. First Responder Bowl is Saturday, 2.30 p.m., and you can watch it live here in KSAT 12. The Ragin Cajuns are favored by two touchdowns. And a cool moment today when the Bryce Strong Foundation donated eight gaming systems, games, headsets, and board games to the University Hospital Adolescent Cancer Unit. This was Bryce's idea after he learned firsthand there wasn't enough gaming systems to go around. We had the uh, child life specialist come in and she asked if we wanted a gaming system. And we were like, okay, yeah, sure. So when she came back, she says, well, I'm sorry, we only have two on the floor, so they're both being used. So we we're like, you only have two? She was like, yeah, we only have two. And so at that moment, Bryce looked at me and says, mom, we got to change that. <laughs> There's too many of us up in here. We need the gaming systems. Since the kids can't group together due to COVID-19, the gaming systems help them pass the time while they're basically in their room, sometimes all alone. That's a great idea. Isn't it? Really is. So fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back.
More than 614,000 COVID-19 vaccine shots have been administered across the U.S. That data coming from the CDC. Operation Warp Speed also estimating about 8 million doses from Moderna and Pfizer will be distributed this week alone. But now, as Nadia Romero reports, there are new concerns about a mutated form of the coronavirus spreading in the United Kingdom and possibly to the U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar and Dr. Anthony Fauci both got their first doses of COVID-19 vaccine on live TV Tuesday morning. As a symbol to the rest of the country that I feel extreme confidence in the safety and the efficacy of this vaccine. But just across the pond in the United Kingdom, people frantically packed trains to get out of London just a few days ago because of another lockdown and fears about a coronavirus mutation spreading in Europe, possibly already here in the U.S. When you have this amount of spread within a place like the UK, that you really need to assume that it's here already. It may not, and certainly is not the dominant strain, but I would not be surprised at all if it is already here. BioNTech's CEO says he has scientific confidence the current Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine will still work to fight against the new variant of coronavirus. There's a high likelihood that the vaccine response will be able also to inactivate this virus because you have to consider that even though nine amino acids are changed in this protein, 99% of the protein is not changed. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., political leaders and health experts getting the vaccine on camera, hoping to increase public confidence. It was exciting. I, I just couldn't wait because it means that we have another tool in our toolbox. Um, in masking, the hand washing, social distancing. From Washington, I'm Nadia Romero. Everybody looking ahead to the Christmas forecast, but we've got some winds to deal with, Adam. Yes, we do, and it's something we're familiar with here over the past couple of weeks. Some gusty winds, especially at night and tomorrow. By about this time, you're going to notice it. First, we have to get through another round of fog and drizzle, so anticipate damp and wet roadways tomorrow morning and reduce visibility. Then becoming windy around this time tomorrow, that's going to set the stage for cooler air Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with a freeze likely in the days ahead. All right, let's take a look at our sky out there. 70 degrees right now. We actually have a lot of low clouds in place. South southeast easterly breeze at 14. So there is a bit of a breeze and it's coming off the Gulf of Mexico. That's just going to continue to stream some moisture in from the Gulf here into town and help add to that fog and drizzle potential for early tomorrow morning. Even by midnight, I anticipate some fog developing. You look at this around 7, 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Visibility is way down. Our future cast indicating a mile or less. And there were parts of South Texas that had a dense fog advisory earlier today. Wouldn't surprise me if some parts of our area fall into that category again tomorrow morning. And that would be visibilities down to a quarter of a mile or less. But by the afternoon, look at this, even by the noon hour, nothing to worry about. Sky clears out, visibilities are just fine. Right now we're right around 70 degrees. Temperatures not falling off much this evening because of the low clouds that are in place. And that southeasterly breeze, I mean, 68 Rio Medina, Bandera 66, along with Canyon Lake, 68 Stinson and Converse area and Pleasanton now at 71. Catula is as warm as 74. We'll see those temperatures gradually falling through the 60s this evening and tonight. So overall, actually relatively warm night tomorrow back into the 70s. But behind the cold front, we get into Thursday and we're looking at a high only in the upper 50s. Friday, Christmas Day, comfortable into the 60s. And then we get into the weekend and we'll bounce back into the 70s. But that cold front's going to hit tomorrow afternoon. And when it does, oh, the wind and you're going to notice it. Not a big deal tonight, not a big deal tomorrow morning. Even in the afternoon tomorrow, you're not really going to notice that wind. Notice three o'clock wind at about five to ten miles per hour. Once we get after dark tomorrow, that's when the wind picks up and we're talking a steady, a sustained wind at 20 to 30 miles per hour. And I anticipate some wind gusts around 40 miles per hour, maybe even in excess of 40 miles per hour. So it's going to be that gusty north wind that we uh, notice behind those stronger cold fronts that uh, make more of an impact when they hit us. 
quiet across the state right now. Just some of those clouds streaming overhead. What's taking shape is what's going to turn into a big winter storm system. That's actually going to give us our cold front. We'll get clipped by it, though. This dip in the upper level flow moving over the Rockies, that's starting to spin up a low pressure system, and that's really going to get cranking and really help pull some colder air southward for the Christmas holiday. And you look at our upper level flow. Notice as we get into Thursday, this big dip in our upper level flow all coming all the way down from Canada that pulls that cool, colder air southward here in Texas. We're on the edge of that cold air, so we'll notice a drop, but really the primary impact with that big change in our pattern is going to be in the Midwest and uh, just the Great Lakes area. They'll be in the core of that cold air and then uh, the big blue H starts to settle in as we get on into the upcoming weekend. All right, so tomorrow here are the details 60 in the morning, but mid 70s in the afternoon. Drizzle fog dampness to start the day and then very gusty by the evening and nighttime hours. And we're going to stay breezy all the way through Thursday morning. So Christmas Eve morning, 33 degrees. Combine that with the wind and it's going to feel like it's down in the 20s. And by Thursday afternoon, only in the upper 50s, despite full sunshine. Christmas Day, likely below freezing in the morning for several hours there and then sunny and comfortable in the 60s in the afternoon. So if the morning chill scares you off from playing with the toys outdoors, just give it a few hours. <laughs> we'll warm up nicely and then the weekends looking comfortable as well. Not scaring any kids off. Some good advice there, <laughs> by the way. Did you notice we're wearing our red and green? That's right. Very unplanned holidayish. Just that much in the spirit. There you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll be right back. We're just about 20 minutes away from an emergency alert being pushed out to your phones. If you live here in Bear County, what the mayor tonight called a plea for everyone to slow the spread of COVID-19 as numbers are incredibly high and they keep on rising. Let's bring in the mayor this evening. Mayor Ron Nirenberg joining us for our Q&A tonight. Mayor, nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks we all know we know the precautions. We know what we're all supposed to be doing. But what are you hearing? from leaders at Metro Health, leaders in local hospitals about how we are faring as a community when it comes to handling this disease, treating the illness, testing. Where are we right now in San Antonio? You know, the numbers are, are, are terrible. I mean, let's be honest, the numbers are terrible. Um, how Bear County though is doing relative to the other communities in the state and the nation actually is pretty good. Uh, we are uh, vaccinating uh, our we are administering the vaccines at a very high rate in comparison to the other communities I, based on the numbers that we are seeing. Uh, we are also uh, seeing a positivity rate that is slightly below our peers. Uh, we are working very well with the hospitals in coordination so we can manage the stress. But this is a surge like we have not experienced before anywhere in the country during this pandemic, and it is severe and we are not immune from it. So we've got to do our part to slow down the spread. It is very difficult out there. It is most difficult on our hospital system and our medical community, and we need everyone to work together now to, to slow the spread of this virus. Mr. Mayor, I know that a lot of times UTSA and some of the hospitals have been doing their own projections on where they think the cases are going. Have you seen those, and are you concerned that you know the 1717 that we saw tonight is just sort of the tip of the iceberg on this whole thing you know we we've been monitoring that very closely and, and what I'll, well, I'll say first about the models uh we use models as a general guide but nearly every model that's come out on COVID 19 that i've seen uh no matter where you are in the country has been broken at one point or another so they're they're general guides but they're not going to be the rule for us in terms of how we can predict the way COVID-19 is going to impact our communities. Uh, with respect to the high numbers, uh, these are much higher than we wanted to see. Uh, they're, not, um, they're not totally um, surprising given the fact that we had a Thanksgiving Day um, uh, holiday right in the middle of when we were starting to see the cases accelerate. And you remember last month, we talked about that and Dr. Fauci was very clear about potentially having um, an event right on top of another event, which is the surge on the surge. And that's what we're seeing right now. What we want to see uh, and what we need to do is make sure everybody is, is practicing physical distancing, mask wearing, because, it, it, and, and most importantly, recognizing that anyone who doesn't live in your household should be treated as if they have the infection. Because if you come in contact with someone 
and and they're not they're not showing symptoms, you can very easily get infected and then go back into your own house where you are likely to let your guard down, be around your family, and and not realize you are now infecting your family. And that's why mask wearing out in public is so incredibly important. But the close contact that we're seeing the spread happen is actually in people's houses. Mayor, you mentioned tonight in the daily briefing that 15 percent of patients in local hospitals are related to COVID. That has direct implications on some businesses if it stays that way per the governor's orders. We have to take a quick break. I'm hoping you'll stick with us for another segment because I want to ask you about those implications on the other side of this. Absolutely. We'll be right back. Continuing our Q&A with Mayor Ron Nirenberg. And Mayor, you mentioned earlier, again, that COVID patients uh, in local hospitals make up 15%, 15.1% right now of occupancy. If it stays that way, what does that mean for businesses in our community because of the governor's orders? Yeah, the state order uh, requires that businesses uh, that, that fall within that category, such as, such as restaurants, would limit occupancy to half, to 50%, once that 15% threshold is reached for seven days. So we are on day one right now. Uh, and you know it's very hard to slow this thing down in one fell swoop. This is like putting on air brakes on a jumbo jet. So we've got to work together. And what that means is that this is day one according to the state order. Uh, day seven would be, I think, December 29th. So this is going to be a, a severe impact on our community, on, on many businesses, if we don't slow that spread down. So um, we've reached that threshold. Uh, it is a, a trigger that we did not want to hit, but here we are. So 912 people are hospitalized at last check with COVID-19. The capacity, if I'm remembering right, to earlier months when we saw the first surge was something around 14, 1600. Is that, is that your understanding as well? We peaked out uh, at around 1,300 COVID patients in the hospital during the summer. Do, is that, and I know they were worried about capacity back then, and that's why I, where I'm coming up with the 14 to 1,600 yeah. total hospital beds that are available for COVID. Yeah, so the hospital capacity, the, the stress on the hospital is, is uh, really about staffing more than it is about equipment, beds. Right. So, um, you know, we already have roughly 660 nurses from the state and the federal government supplementing the stress on staff uh, because we just don't have uh, staff available for these COVID patients if, if the rates continue. So we're already reaching a level of stress that, that you know, uh, again, is, is taking a toll on our hospital system. In terms of what is that, what is that ultimate capacity where, where we, the point of no return, um, hospitals are able to manage that stress by reducing the number of elective surgeries, by uh, rescheduling and delaying some surgeries. They're already beginning to do that right now. And so we've got to, again, slow this down because projections show that this is gonna get worse before it gets better. So there's a lot of things underway right now to, to help manage the stress in the hospitals. If we don't do our part as members of the public, uh, we can be in a, in a serious situation before too long. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, as always, thanks so much for joining us. A lot of questions to ask. I'm sure we'll be talking to you again soon. All right. We'll be right back. Here's today's I See Why Am I. And good morning to you. It is Tuesday. It is December 22nd. It's a robbery suspect likely nursing quite a headache after a would-be victim stopped him in his tracks with a frying pan. This all started when police say the man robbed another man of his wallet and phone. The suspect took off and allegedly climbed a fence to the Spice Creek Apartments and kicked in the front door of a unit there, trying to rob that couple at gunpoint. The couple fought back, smacking the suspect in the head with that frying pan and taking away his gun, which turned out to be fake. The police say they're looking for a suspect after officers were approached by a man last night who told them he'd been stabbed in the back. He said he'd been stabbed about five miles away, but officers say they couldn't find a scene. At last update, the victim remained in critical condition. Police have not released a suspect description or any other information.
Millions of vials shipped and hundreds of thousands of doses injected across the country in just weeks. The Moderna and Pfizer vaccines now giving America its best tool to fight back against the coronavirus. The nation's top infectious disease expert himself getting his shot today, along with Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar. It's another round of stimulus checks are coming your way. The bill adds $300 in weekly federal unemployment benefits and provides nearly $300 billion in aid to small businesses, plus more than $8 billion for distributing the vaccine. And those stimulus checks, a one-time payment of up to $600 for those making up to $75,000 per year. Ford's new ugly Christmas sweater serves two purposes. One, it's ugly, and two, okay. it helps with social distancing. The automaker calls this the safe distance Christmas jumper. It projects the shape of a Christmas tree around you and creates a safe zone for others nearby. All right, the sweater works through small projectors hidden in the reindeer's antlers, nose and tail. It's a concept design, so it appears you can't get one just yet. It's also unclear if the projection works in daylight. I'm guessing it doesn't. The sweater is part of Ford's ongoing share the road campaign to promote safe driving. That sounds like the a shape of a tree, right? Mm. It does seem yes. like something Caskey would come up with. He's had some good, ugly sweaters in the past. It's, it's true. Award-winning. Award-winning. I'm sorry. Award no projections, winning. though. No projections.